Good morning, everybody. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and get started. It's about that time. So um, if you didn't already get a character table, raise your hand, because we have a bunch of them here. All right, looks like almost everybody did. Um, in, case, uh, in case you haven't met our TAs yet, this is Jerry. I think uh, John Mark and Upali you know from last quarter, yes? OK. All right, so we have a lot to do today. Um, we're going to do a few more examples of assigning molecules to point groups. So I hope everybody has your flow chart um, hopefully corrected. There's a, a corrected one posted online. There were a couple mistakes. So sorry about that. Please do check out the corrected version. Um, also, so you should have your flow chart and your character table that we're handing out in order to be able to, to go through the examples. And so hopefully everybody tried the practice problems on assigning things to point groups. And we're going to go through a few of those this morning. And then we're going to continue to talking about matrix representations. So somebody also asked me when the lectures are going to be posted online. And uh, I actually don't know. But the person who does know is Sean, who's doing the filming in the back. Can you tell us when that's going to be? Yeah, so well, actually, uh, the first lecture is available online. You can search on uh, YouTube. Just search like the first name or uh, UCI Open Courseware. That's, that's our department. Uh, you'll be able to find it the professor's name and the class name. Um, I'll send a link to, to you and you can send it to everybody else. It's just one link that will consistently be updated with the latest lecture. So the first one is online right now. Great, thanks. So in general, um, how long do you think it's going to take for, for yeah, so after each lecture, how long? It should be less than a day to a day. Great, thank you very much. So that's where they'll be. All right, um, any more questions about logistics, things like that? One thing I should mention is that uh, my, office, my Wednesday office hours are, are 3 to 4. I'm going to have that. A bunch of people showed up at office hours yesterday. We had a really good discussion, so I encourage you to do that. The Tuesday office hours, I think, are going to be moved to 11 to 12 from, from now on to avoid conflicting with our discussions. So is there some uh, class that everyone has to take Tuesday from 11 to 12 that, that I don't know about? OK, good. That's, uh, that sounds like a winner. OK, so let's talk about some point group examples. OK, can. Can everybody see OK? So unfortunately, I don't have very much control over the lights. Our choices are like that and like that. So raise your hand if you like it better darker. Raise your hand if you like it better brighter. OK, darker it is. All right, so if we have a molecule like this, and we want to assign it to a point group, what do we want to do? We need to get out our flow charts and look at, uh, does this thing belong to any of the special groups? So we have low symmetry, high symmetry, and uh, linear. So if we added one more substituent here, then that would be you know, something like sulfur hexafluoride or xenon hexafluoride. Then uh, that would be an octahedral molecule, but we don't. We have this. So what do you think? I think uh, I'm going to get somebody to volunteer to assign this thing to a point group. You just volunteered. Oh, no. <laughs> OK, so just to, so everyone can, can see what it looks like here. So we've got this thing that has a square on the bottom, and then it's got one substituent sticking up. And the thing that keeps it from being high symmetry is that it doesn't have another one on the bottom. 
So it's not high symmetry? So it's not high symmetry. Okay. Um. So now what? Now, I, now we need to find the principal axis. Would it be um, C4? That's right, it's, it has a C4 axis. Okay, so that's good. So now the next question is, do we have some C2 axes that are perpendicular to that C4 axis? Some what? C2 axes. Can we, can we do some 180 degree rotations perpendicular to the C4? Uh, I'm going to say no. No, grab the model and pick it up. It'll be easier to, to see. So, OK, so try to hold it under the camera so everybody okay, can see. There so you go. If that's the C4, yeah. then so there's 90 degrees for the C4. Right. Well, so that's your C4 operation. Right. But so but, perpendicular to that. But perpendicular to that, can we? To, so perpendicular to that, it would be running through there. So if you rotate 180 degrees, it's not the same, right? If you rotate 180 degrees, it's it's not the same. Yeah. Like that, no. So what do you think? Everybody agree? Yeah. So there's no so there's no there's no C2 axes. Okay. So now we've got. We know that it's got to be a, a C or S2N group. So what do you think? Does it have a, a horizontal plane perpendicular to that axis? Yes. No. Um, well, so remember, here's our principal yeah, axis. There, I know there's one parallel. Yeah, there's, so well, there's, there's, there's two parallel. There's two parallel. But Is that what dihedral? It's, well, it's vertical, right? Because okay. it contains the, the principal so axis. Two planes. To be dihedral, it would also have to bisect some C2 axes, and, and so, we don't have any C2 axes, so they're vertical planes. So, so you're, do, do I denote that like this? Well, you're on the right track. But the question, if we're following the flow chart, is just does it have a, a horizontal plane? No. Okay, sure. So the question is, how do we know which symmetry planes are, are vertical and which ones are horizontal? And the definition of that in this context is that if your symmetry plane contains the principal axis, it's vertical. We also have dihedral planes. Those also contain the principal axis. Not every molecule has them. And they bisect the C2 axes that are perpendicular, if there are any. In this case, there aren't. Um, a horizontal plane would be one that cuts perpendicular to the principal axis. So what do you think? Does this molecule have one? <coughs> no, right? Because if we flipped it over, then this substituent would be down instead of up, and it wouldn't be the same thing. So is it C2V? So it is, you are very close. It would be C2V. C4V, C4V right. Right, it, it would be C2V if, it, if its principal axis was a C2 axis, yeah, yeah, yeah. but instead it's a C4. So great job. I've Thanks never seen for this uh, stuff before. You did a good job. Yes. A dihedral plane is also it's also it's like a vertical plane in that it contains the the principal axis, but it also bisects your C2 planes that are perpendicular to it. All right. We need to have one discussion going on and not many. I'm really happy to answer everybody's question, but, but we need to do them in series and not in parallel. OK, so the question is, what's a dihedral plane? So let's, let's find a molecule that has some. I made a whole bunch of models, which is really nice, except that I can't find anything. OK, so, so here's benzene. So some rules for looking at symmetry. In general, we're going to say that you know, resonance structures, when we're assigning things to a point group, we're going to assume that resonance structures are fluctuating back and forth so quickly that, uh, that we can't see the individual structures, which of course is, that's why we have resonance structures anyway. It's an, it, you have an average of these bond lengths. So this molecule, which you can go through the, the point group, it belongs to the D6H group, so it belongs to one of the D groups because it has a horizontal plane. It has its principal axis is a C6 axis, so benzene is D6H. And so when we were talking about just now, do we have 
C2 axes perpendicular to the principal axis. In this case, we do. We can flip it over all kinds of different ways. I stole your pen. Oh, thank you. So we can flip it over, looks like three different ways perpendicular to that, uh, that axis. And so then we also have uh, some dihedral planes, which are vertical planes that bisect those C2 axes. And one thing that's really nice about the character tables is that some of these symmetry elements are really hard to, to visualize, or at least when you, when you go through and try to count all of them and make sure you didn't miss any. And the good news is that you don't really have to do that because once you assign the molecule to a point group, if you open up your point group table and look at the D6H group, the first thing you notice is that uh, benzene has a lot of symmetry operations, but it lists for you what they all are. And so you don't necessarily have to go through and find all of them yourself. Once you get it into a point group, then you can go back after the fact and, and check out what all the symmetry elements are. The character table gives you a lot of other information about the molecule, and we're going to talk about a lot of that today. But before we go on, I do want to uh, talk a little bit more about assigning things to point groups, because this is a really important skill that if you have a hard time with it, it's going to be challenging to, to keep up later on. So let's make sure that everyone gets it. And again, if you don't and you need more practice, stay after class. I'll be here answering questions. Um, come to office hours. Ask the TAs in discussion. You know, it's, it, it is something that uh, once you get it, you do. But it, it can take a little bit of practice. OK, so let's look at this molecule. Can I have another victim? I mean, uh, volunteer. So that molecule has some interesting things going on. Okay, so here's your flow chart. So the first thing we want to know is it, does it, it's not linear, we can tell that. Is it low symmetry or high symmetry? Okay, this is a controversial molecule. Some people are saying it's high symmetry and other people are saying it's low symmetry. Okay, so I don't think it's high symmetry, right? Because it's not, it's not icosahedral and it's not tetrahedral. That would be like this. And octahedral, we saw a little while ago. So, well, let's see if it's low symmetry. So, to give examples of some of the low symmetry point groups, C1 is the one that doesn't have any symmetry elements. That's like that. Do you think it's like that? Does it have no symmetry elements? I can see one, right? It looks like it has an inversion center. If I turned it inside out, this carbonyl would go over here, and this CH2 would go over here, and this methyl group would go over there. So another assumption that we make, you know, I said that we assume that resonance structures are their average structure. We also assume that there's free rotation about single bonds. So those methyl groups are just spinning around. If we're going to talk about it in terms where, the, where that's not going to happen, I'll tell you that the molecule is really, really cold, so it's not moving. Otherwise, we're, we're going to assume that it does. Okay, so. It's not low symmetry, or at least it's not C1. So what about something like CS? That's where it just has the identity and a mirror plane. Yeah. We already know it's not that, because we said it has an inversion center. One of the other low symmetry groups is yeah. CI. 
which means it only has an inversion center. So what do you think? Does that thing have anything going on other than its inversion center? So if we cut it like this, we would have this carbonyl over here and that one over there, and that wouldn't be the same, right? Is there any way we can rotate it? What do you think? Yeah, I think she's right. It doesn't have anything else going on. So that is, the, that is CI. Thank you. OK, so that's, um, those are some examples of, you know, now you see what the, the low symmetry groups look like. And I think we're going to stop there for examples, although you know, I'm happy to do huge numbers more if you come to office hours or, or stay after class or th things like that. Um, I guess another thing that I want to uh, point out is that until you get good at doing it really fast and just looking at them, it's best to go through the flowchart and assign them. So one thing that people get confused about is looking at the, the symmetry operations versus the names of the point groups. So for instance, I noticed that one, one mistake that people make sometimes is looking at something and saying it has an improper rotation axis. And so then they think it has to belong to one of the S2N groups. And not necessarily, lots of things can have an improper rotation axis without belonging those, to those groups. So you know, it's, it's good if you, just, if you just go through systematically and look at the flowchart. OK, so I think that's, uh, that's it for playing with the Tinker Toys today. Let's uh, go on and do some other things. So I'm going to switch back to PowerPoint. Yes? I'm sorry, can you speak up, please? Sure. So an improper rotation, again, is when you, re when you rotate by 360 degrees over N and then reflect, about a, reflect through a plane that's perpendicular to that axis. So if it were an S3 axis, we would rotate by 120 degrees and then reflect. Um, I can show that, sure. So, all right, we still have that up there. So if I were going to do an improper rotation, I would rotate by a third of a turn and then reflect. It, you know, flip it. So, so it's, so rotate by a third of a turn and then reflect through this plane. So, I, so see what I mean? I can't, I can't quite do it to the, the model, but that's, that's what it is. Okay, so let's, um, one more question. When you're looking for a point group of something like ethane, would you do it for staggered form or excess form? That's a good question. So the, so the question is for, for ethane, if you're looking for the point group, would it be staggered or eclipsed? So remember we said that by default, if I don't tell you anything about it, we're going to assume that there's free rotation about single bonds. So you can just assume that those methyl groups are rotating. If I wanted you to do it for staggered or eclipsed ethane, I would have to tell you that specifically. Otherwise, you wouldn't know. And you know, of course, th those configurations do exist at, at low temperatures. It's just, you know, otherwise we're assuming things like methyl groups are just rotating around all the time. So that means you pretty much ignore the hydrogens. In that case, we, I mean, yeah, you just treat it as one big substituent. You know, it's it's just a the methyl group is just freely rotating. Um, you know, that said, we might see problems where, we're, where we say that something is staggered or eclipsed, and you just have to pay attention to the description of the molecule. OK, so now let's talk about all the information that you get in the character table. So, so far we've done examples where we look at how to um, put things into a particular point group. And that leaves aside the question of why do we want to do this. So the reason we want to do this is that once we do, we get all kinds of information about the molecule for free. Somebody already collected it and put it in this character table. We can use it. OK. I would really like this to show my slides now.
Okay, good, there we go. All right, so there's our flow chart. Okay, so now let's talk about the character table. So everybody has this in front of them. Let's look at the information that it gives you. Okay, so I have put some examples here on this sheet just to, uh, just to show some. And we're going to be using this a lot, so please bring it to class to uh, follow along um, that, with the discussion. And these are the same character tables that you'll be given on the exam. So, okay, so if we have the C2V character table, so that's um, a familiar molecule that belongs to that point group is water, just to, to visualize it. And let's look at the information that we have here. So, so in the top left, we have the name of the point group. And then going along the top, we have the names of the symmetry operations that belong to that point group. So E is the identity, so that's do nothing. C2 is 180 degree rotation. And then we have these two planes, sigma V XZ and sigma V prime YZ. So they're, they're called uh, sigma and sigma prime just to distinguish that they're not equivalent to each other. Because if we have a water molecule, and this is a little bit hard to see because it's small, but you know everybody knows what water looks like, so it should be okay. We have our two planes. One is we can slice through the molecule like this so that one hydrogen ends up on either side. And the other one is we can cut through the whole thing so that we're slicing through the, through the hydrogen, oxygen, hydrogen bonds. And those two planes are not equivalent to each other, so that's why they get separate entries in the table. And then the next question is what are the x, y, how are the x, y, and z axes defined? The principal axis is always the z axis, and then you just use the, the right hand rule. Okay, so that tells us the total number of operations. And the number of operations that exists in the group is kind of a measure of the, the symmetry of the molecule. And so for C2V, there are only four of them. We have the identity, we have the 180 degree rotation, and then we've got these two reflection planes. And so that's kind of all there is. All right, we're going to come back to what all the rest of this stuff is, but let's look at C3V now. So that's a molecule like ammonia. Question over here. Um, we haven't gotten to that yet. We're gonna come back to it. Okay, so, so right now we're just talking about the, the symmetry operations in the group. Okay, so if we think about ammonia, that has the identity in, in this group, which everything does. And then if we look at the next entry, we have two C3. And so what that means is that there are two C3 operations that you can do. So I have my ammonia molecule and I have one of the hydrogens sticking out toward you and the other ones are, are pointing off to the sides. And what the 2C3 designation means is that I can rotate this once and that gives us an equivalent state as far as symmetry but it's not identical to where it started out. And then I can rotate it again and you know again it's, it's symmetrically equivalent but if we could tag all of these hydrogens, so I mean imagine that we can isotopically label them so that one's a proton and one is tritium and the other one's deuterium so we can tell them apart. We have to go around the third time before we get back to the initial configuration. And this is an important thing. We have to be able to make a distinction between things that are valid symmetry operations, which this is, and being able to tell the difference between that and the original configuration. So that's why we have two C3 operations because we have one, two, before we get back to the original configuration. It doesn't mean that it has two separate C3 axes. Now, don't get confused because in some other point groups, it might mean that something has multiple axes that are the same. But the important lesson here is that when you have something listed as you know, that operation, so like sigma and sigma prime, that means they're not equivalent. But if it's called two sigma, then those, it's describing two operations that are equivalent. So then similarly, 
we have three sigma v, so remember a vertical plane contains the principal axis and we have three of them because we can cut through any of these bonds and that gives us a symmetry operation and they're all equivalent to each other. So, yeah, question over there. The, um, the, the molecule that had the, the square on the bottom and then something sticking up, it was in the, in the C4V. Yeah, that's an interesting question. So you do have, so you have C3, C4, but only two C2, right? Because you can, you can go, uh, you know, one way and then the other way. Okay, so tetrahedral, we're not gonna go through all of them, but notice it has a lot of symmetry operations and that should fit with your intuition that a tetrahedral molecule like methane is more symmetric than, than these other things. So another important uh, uh, characteristic is, is uh, the number that you get when you add up all of these symmetry operations, that's called H. Some point group tables give it to you. This one doesn't, so you have to add it up yourself, but, but uh, that's something you can do. All right, question. Oh, so you said the two C3, that means that you have to do two C3 operations before you get back to the identity, like the original? Before you get back to the original molecule, yeah. And you said, and does it matter which way you rotate them? You know, by convention, we usually do it counterclockwise, but, you know, no, if you did everything the other way, as long as you're consistent, you'd get the same answers. But for, for purposes of doing stuff in class, the convention is usually we do it counterclockwise. Yes? This example is the 2C3, and that other one, that square pyramidal one you had, mm -hmm. is that one's 2C2? Um, well, so if you rotate about the principal axis, you can do the C4 three times before you get back to the, the first. Uh, and you say, yeah, if you do the C2, it's uh, 2 C2? Because in that case, if you rotated it like this or like this, you would get, there, there were two ways to do it. There's two ways to rotate that one. So the, my, my point is just, you know, be careful because there, there are, these operations with coefficients in front of them indicating that you have multiple ways to do the same operation. And sometimes it means just that you can do the operation a couple of times before you get back to the original state. And other times it means that you have different axes or, or different planes that are equivalent. We'll, we'll see more examples of this as it, as it comes up. I don't wanna spend a whole bunch of time talking about every case because uh, it gets a little bit abstract. Let's, let's wait and see examples. Okay, so now, what is all the rest of this stuff on the character table? That's a lot of what we're gonna spend time on today and Friday. Okay, so these A's and E's and T's, those are the irreducible representations or the symmetry species of the group. And what those are, it's, it's a complete description of objects that can behave in certain ways under these particular symmetry operations. And we're gonna talk about that with some concrete examples a little bit later on. So some things to know about them. The ones that are called A and B are singly degenerate. The ones that are called E are doubly degenerate. And the ones that are called T are triply degenerate. And then let's look at the other information that you get in this table, which starts to give you some, some hints about how you might be able to use this information. And that is, we have things like X, Y, and Z. We have X, Y, X, Z, Y, Z. These are linear and quadratic terms you know, in terms of the, the Cartesian coordinates. So for X, Y, and Z, right now you can think about that as either a little unit vector directed along the appropriate axis, or you can think about it as a px, py, or pz orbital in terms of how it transforms related to symmetry. Those are very uh, intuitive concepts for, for chemists and, and chemical engineers, so it helps if you visualize it as an orbital. The xy, uh, xz, et cetera, x squared minus y squared, you can think about those as d orbitals. They're going to have other interpretations when we get into talking about infrared and Raman spectroscopy later in the course, but for now you can think about these just in terms of orbitals. 
Okay, so you can start to see what's useful about this table. So once you assign something to a point group, for one thing, there's a limited number of objects that can behave a certain way under these symmetry operations. We have a complete set of symmetry operations to work with. And we can already see that we learned some information about how at least orbitals behave with respect to this, this symmetry. And this is already written down for you in the table. OK, so having gone over that a little bit, we are going to switch gears and talk about uh, matrices and how to make matrix representations of operators. And we're going to do a little review of um, how to deal with matrices. Hopefully this is review for everybody. If not, we're going to go over what you need to know about it, so don't worry. If you need a little bit of extra practice or background, please uh, check out the Wikipedia page and or the Wolfram site on, uh, on matrices and matrix multiplications, <coughs> rotation operators, things like that. OK, so if we have a matrix, which we're going to call A, these entries are its matrix elements. And we can call those AIJ. We'll see that kind of terminology a lot. So in this case, A11 is minus 3. A12 is 6, et cetera. That's just uh, how we label them. And we're just going to go through a quick review of uh, how to deal with, with matrices. So you can add them if they have the same number of rows and columns. And if, if you can do it, it's pretty easy. You just add up the individual matrix elements. And so here's what you get in this case. We just add the, the individual matrix elements and get uh, these cells. So I know everybody's probably seen this stuff before, but it doesn't hurt to, to have a little bit of a review, especially since if, uh, if you didn't really talk about matrix representations of operators last quarter. It, uh, it actually makes your life quite a bit easier, I think. I think it's, uh, it's much easier to deal with operators in that formalism. OK, so that's how we add them. That uh, actually doesn't come up terribly often in the kind of things that we're going to do. Here's something that does. If you want to find the trace of a matrix, you just add the elements on the diagonal. And ignore everything else that might be in the matrix. It doesn't matter. We're just going to add the elements that are along the diagonal. The trace is also often called the character, which gives you a hint as to what the character table is about and why we're talking about this right now. So all of those ones and minus ones and zeros and twos, et cetera, on the character tables, each one represents the character of the matrix that corresponds to that particular operation for a particular symmetry species. And we're going to learn how to make our own, if not by the end of, uh, of t if not today, by uh, Friday. OK, so the character is uh, a lot of times given the symbol chi. In this case, it's 7. So that's a really important uh, matrix operation. Fortunately, it's easy. We can also multiply them by scalars. In order to do that, we just multiply each element in the matrix by the scalar. And we can take the trace of that one, too. So again, pretty straightforward stuff, um, but it's good to to go, to go over it just in case. All right, let's talk about matrix multiplication also, in case uh, you haven't seen it in a little while. So when we go to multiply the matrices, I'm going to uh, write this all out once. So we go through and multiply the row of the first row of this one by the first column of that one. So we get one, 1 times 5 plus 2 times 8 as the first uh, matrix element in the new matrix. 
and then we just go across. So now we have 1 times 6 plus 2 times 9, etc. And we build up our new matrix like that. So pretty simple, but uh, you have to double check because it's easy to make a mistake. How many people have taken Chem 5 or otherwise know Mathematica? It's a lot easier if you use Mathematica. So most of the examples that we'll do in class will be relatively simple and uh, you know, you'll be able to do it in your head fine enough, but if you have to do this for matrices of any size, use Mathematica, makes it, makes it a lot easier. Okay, so here's what we get for this particular one. And it's also worth pointing out that matrix multiplications don't necessarily commute. So if we multiply these two things together and then we do it in the other order, you don't get the same answer. And, you know, of course, this, this relates to stuff that you learned last quarter in quantum mechanics. A lot of, a lot of operators don't necessarily commute and they can be represented as, as matrices. And we'll also see that in some point groups, symmetry operations may or may not commute. All right, so other things to look at. If uh, the product of two matrices equals zero, that doesn't necessarily imply that either of the matrices has all zeros in it. There are different ways to get that. So that's our, our little review of matrix properties. Again, if you need more review than that, check out the Wolfram site and or Wikipedia. Wikipedia is a really great resource on things like this that are, that are non-controversial. Of course, uh, things where, there's, where there are differences of opinion, people can change it all the time and troll each other. Nobody really does that on sort of basic uh, math and chemistry and physics topics, so it's, uh, it's a good thing to use as a resource. Okay, so now that we've talked about properties of matrices, Let's start looking at how to construct transformation matrices for actual operations that we might want to do. And we're going to do it in two-dimensional space to start with, just to make things easier. Okay, so the way we're going to do this is we're going to think about, you know, I want to accomplish some transformation and I'm going to apply it to a test vector, which I'm just calling alpha beta. And we need to think about what do we want alpha beta to transform into? And then what matrix do we have to multiply by it to get that result? So if we want a reflection about the y-axis, remember we're in a two-dimensional plane. So we need to think about what do we multiply by alpha beta in order to get it reflected about the y-axis? So of course, if we reflect it about the y-axis, beta isn't going to change and alpha is going to change sign. And so working backwards, we have to think about what do we need to multiply by that vector in order to accomplish our transformation. <coughs> and as we're going to see, the matrix you get depends on what, what you're trying to do, what object you're applying it to. But we're going to talk about the cases of just doing this in two-dimensional and three-dimensional space. Okay, so what if we want to do a projection the x-axis? So we only want to see the x component. So what do we have to multiply by alpha beta to get just uh, the projection on the x-axis? Yeah, so I, I hear people following along so, I, so everyone gets it, that's cool. All right, what if we want to scale it by three? So we just need something that has threes on the diagonal. So this is why I like group theory and these kind of geometric transformations because it really gives intuition into how we can set up matrix representations of different operators. The quantum mechanical operators, of course, are all linear operators, as you learned last quarter, so they can be represented this way. 
But doing this with these geometrical things helps give us an intuition for how to use it before we have to, to get into more complicated concepts. OK, so in general, if we have some vector and we want to rotate it, so we had our first vector r1, and now we move it into this position r2. If we just set up uh, how we want to do this rotation, if we look at x2 and, and y2, we have r cosine alpha plus theta and r sine alpha plus theta. And we can expand this out. And that gives us the rotation matrix that we need to be able to perform this, uh, this particular transformation. Rotation matrices are something that we're going to see a lot. We're going to use them now when we talk about group theory. So hopefully it's clear how that's going to work and, and how we're going to use that quite a bit. We're also going to use them when we talk about NMR spectroscopy and look at, uh, at how spins behave in a magnetic field. And really, they come up in all kinds of uh, different areas of chemistry and physics. It's a useful thing to know how to do. OK, so having gotten this far, you have enough information to definitely do the practice problems, which are posted online. So don't try to write them all down right now. I just want to point out that that's there. Um, so do go ahead and check these out online and try to do them for, for Friday. Having looked at that, let's move on to three dimensions. So we talked about our little two-dimensional rotation matrix. Now let's look at this in three dimensions. And our basis is little unit vectors pointing in the x, y, and z dimensions. And notice I'm going to try to be really careful about telling you what basis I'm using. And if I don't, you should ask me, because it's a really important question. That affects everything about the, the problem. So right now, it's just our, our unit vectors. OK, so what if we want to do a C2 rotation, so 180 degrees? <laughs> so if we have our x, y, and z unit vectors, that's going to flip the signs of x and y and leave z alone. And so this is going to tell us what our matrix is. Yeah. I think it's uh, two slides ago. You mm -hmm. have that set up and it came out sort of two by two. Is it supposed to be a two by one on the right side of the this side? Like that well, one, a three by one? This is in three dimensions now. We were doing it in two dimensions before. So in the two dimensional ones, the, it comes out to a two by two matrix? Yeah, so that so so that's you raise a really important point, which is why I said that I have to be very careful to always tell you what the what the basis is that we're using because it changes everything about the problem. So you know if we if we're starting with so before we were starting with a you know a, a two we're starting with a two by two because we had a two dimensional vector. Now we have a three dimensional vector, okay, well, and I so I think the matrix multiplication is wrong because. You have the two by two and a two by one you multiply by. Mm -hmm. You have the negative one, zero, zero, one, and then alpha, beta. And then it came out to negative alpha, zero, zero, beta. So a two by one times a two by two times a two by one goes to a two by two. I don't see how that works. I'm going to check it and write up, uh, write up something about it. Sorry about that. It's just I want to get through a little bit more of this before class, and you know whatever is is confusing, we can we can go over later. Okay, so let's talk about our rotation matrix for C4. So this one's a little bit more complicated because we flipped the position of x and y. We made x negative, and again z stays the same because we're rotating about the, the principal axis. Oops. And so that's the rotation matrix that we end up with for C4. And 
And so what I want to point out is that here's what we get for a general rotation matrix about any angle. We need to put in the, the sines and cosines. And so in Cartesian coordinates, here are the general rotation matrices for some angle about the x, y, and z axes. And these are things that, that are going to come up over and over again, and we're going to use them. So again, you don't have to write it down right now. This is, uh, you know, it's available. You can look it up. But they are going to come up, and it's important. I also want to point out that the inverse of a matrix is the matrix that if you multiply a matrix times its inverse, you're going to get an identity matrix, which has just ones on the diagonal and zeros everywhere else. Sometimes it's called I if we're talking about the identity operation in, in terms of the, the uh, character tables, we call it E. And if A represents some transformation, then its inverse, which is called A to the minus 1, undoes it and returns it to its original state. And here that is written out. So, OK, that's pretty good as far as where I wanted to get this time. Um, next time, we're going to tie it all together and see how to use this in terms of group theory. Yes? 